No hurry from us. No, okay. Not waterproof. <laughs> I have made a waterproof book. Yeah. A, uh, my pool, students. Pool friendly, Los Angeles friendly book. No, it was it was actually in my my students published. I, we yeah. did a class publication, and they found a cover that was made of some waterproof material, and we purposely <laughs> spilled on it at the reading to prove that it was. <laughs> that was <water> <laughs> Am I, okay. Welcome back to the Effective Design Conference here at Kunz Institute Melli. Uh, my name's Vivian Zahal and I'm the Research and Program Manager. Like many of our speakers, I'm not sure which camera I'm looking to, but I'll pick one, this one. And uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our penultimate session for day one of the conference, uh, in which we have a pairing of special guests. Uh, we always love to welcome guests back once again, and that's very much the situation with this program, where we once again have David Moroto and book clubbers with us. So last year, at about exactly this time in October, uh, we were delighted to launch uh, the artist novel, the novel a medium, uh, the novel as a medium in visual art. Uh, that was the result of a long-term research uh, by David Moroto, but also very much in the context of book lovers, which also involves Joanna Julinska, uh, and which explores the different ways in which the artist novel is employed as a medium in the visual arts. Uh, that's a project that has been ongoing for many years uh, with the continuous support of MUCA Antwerp uh, through Joanna's work, but also with many other partners. And in fact, it was first at De Appel in Amsterdam that I first encountered book lovers as a willing subject of an artistic reading <laughs> uh, in a bit of an artistic blind date at the time. Um, so on the invitation of book lovers, uh, there's a new strand emerging within their research, which is to branch out and look at the curator novel or the critic novel. And that's a very emerging uh, research on their part. Uh, and so as a beginning, they're undertaking a series of sort of close studies with special guests who've been uh, blazing trails within this particular area. And so uh, to kick off that research, they've invited Mark von Schlegel, who we're delighted to have back in the building <laughs> and back in the institution, uh, albeit uh, with a new name this evening, which is Kunst Institute Melli. So Mark, uh, according to his biography, has been obscuring the line between fiction and criticism since 1992. So that's <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a brand promise. Sorry. <laughs> On your part, uh, but uh, Mark is the author of 11 published books of science fiction and criticism, uh, of which there are many titles that you can also see here on the table. Uh, some that viewers might know include um, contributing text to a widely shown trilogy of films by Ben Rivers, which included Slow Action, Earth, and Look Then Below, which came out just last year. His first novel was called Venusia, and it was published by Semiotext and Marx published many books by Samuel Your Text, and that book, Venusia, was honors listed for the Otherwise Prize in Science Fiction, uh, among many other uh, accolades for his publication. So without further ado, I'll hand over to book lovers and to Mark for this evening's program. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. You start? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we are two, so we have to coordinate. Uh, yeah, thank you, Vivian, <coughs> and thanks to the Kunst Institute, uh, Meli, and to Sofia for inviting us to here today. It, is it better now? Yeah. Yes, okay. Um, so, yes, I just wanted to start with a thank you for your invitation. We are very uh, happy to yeah, be here. Yeah, thank you, and I think we def definitely can add one more layer to the discussion uh, which, which happened before us by uh, talking about the relationship between book format, exhibition space, and fiction. Uh, as Vivian mentioned, uh, together with David, we are conducting a research project on uh, artist uh, novel, asking a question how a novel can become a medium in uh, visual arts uh, on the same condition as um, 
photography or painting, for example. As part of this research, we, we developed a bibliography uh, of artist novels, uh, but also a um, collection and online database uh, which is hosted by uh, MUCA, Museum uh, of Contemporary Art in Antwerp. Um, in 10 years, we curated uh, numerous projects uh, based on, uh, on our research, um, uh, exhibitions, a pop-up bookstore, in, uh, which w actually happened in the Apple, uh, performative programs and uh, seminars. And during this period, we, uh, we learned about some novels uh, 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 jointly written by artists and curators. Um, so um, we also encounter uh, numerous of uh, curators' uh, novels. And we started to be interested uh, in this phenomenon. So in a way, we are at the beginning, on the first stage of our research, which mm -hmm. is focus on, on this specific uh, kind of fiction writing. Yeah, we call it, for lack of a better name, we call it the curator's novel. Um, but this term doesn't refer exactly to a novel that has been written by, a, by an art curator. That's not exactly what we mean by that. <clears throat> because a legitimate question could be, yeah, in what way is a novel written by a curator different from a novel written by a sailor or a doctor? And, we don't have an answer for that. That's not what we are interested in. Uh, when we use the curator's novel, uh, we refer to those instances uh, where the novel has been conceived to operate as a curatorial device. Um, and obviously, this has connections with the artist's novel, like we were describing before, uh, which is something that operates within the discourse of uh, uh, artistic discourse rather than literature. But it also overlaps, and uh, this is very specific of the curator's novel, let's call it like that, with um, what has been known as fictocriticism or fictocritical writing, uh, in that it is uh, a work of fiction, yes, but it has an obvious, uh, it's fiction at the service of um, critical analysis of contemporary art in, in, in this case. Um, so all this uh, introduced uh, with the idea of the curator's novel in mind, uh, we <coughs> wanted to have a conversation today with Mark because his uh, new dystopia uh, novel is really a prime example of what a curator's novel could be. And um, before we start discussing, we thought that it would be nice to hear what new dystopia sounds like. So if it's okay with you, Mark, if you could read sure. maybe a few lines uh, from your own novel. So we talk about something that we already heard yeah, afterwards. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, thanks to the book lovers. We've worked together before because I'm also a book lover, but not one of the book lovers, I'm just a book lover. Um, yeah, the book, uh, this was a catalog for um, the exhibition that is now about to come off the screen. Uh, yeah, that's the main room, but it was a large group exhibition. And um, the book was designed uh, in relation to the architecture of this museum so that, um, let me just, uh, I don't know why that's coming up, but yeah, and um, clear. <coughs> you should maybe pick here. The other one. The other one. Yeah. Thanks. These are various views of, so the museum had a giant room called the nave. It had these galleries where, uh, side galleries where we had work. Um, and so it's called the CAPC in Bordeaux. And it's this giant warehouse that actually um, has ties to the slave trade, I think, and in some ways, and has a kind of dystopic past already. So um, in the curation, part of it was just to allow the building to, its history to kind of seep through. Um, but yeah. And uh, in, I'm going to read you part of uh, the section of the book. The beginning is called Lobby, which is like the prologue. And then there's a section called Galleries, which is s sort of fragmented, cut up, a la Burroughs or something, science fictional texts that are related to the artists in the show. And were usually originally composed for artists in that show. Um, 
and I will read from the galleries just two fragments from two of these different um, running stories that, I, that this book as a novel ties together. The Shakespeare frowned. He looked at his hands. He found they had changed. Spots had appeared, veins risen like roots. The skin had hardened. He remembered the painting. Against his soft, aged skin, the gaze pressed the harder on him, as if he could no longer move without touching the hard and outer lens of those oval eyes. As potent a fear it caused in him, it was nothing to the horror that sprayed along his spine when he looked up to find that the vivid face was no longer looking at him. A young fellow had entered. He wore a checkered jerkin and was surprised at seeing someone else in the otherwise empty room. A stab of sudden jealousy passed through our friend, followed by a more frightening emotion when he saw the young man meet the painting's eyes. It's impossible to remember this, he said, for he could feel the discomfort of the young man beside him as if it were his own discomfort, but could no longer remember it. He looked on the painting. The impeccably real face was rendered with studied ambiguity, but it had seemed to grow darker. It was appearing, in fact, less and less finished. The young man spoke coldly, his words echoing in the unadorned chamber. Why are you old? The Shakespeare scoffed. He was young. A sudden image came to his mind. Red banners, great red banners weaving out into the sky. A woman, a girl almost. She was so young then, stood beside him. They were below the flags among the crowds assembled in the open Danish domes. Earth hung round above them, upside down. Tell them, the painting said, I will not be the Shakespeare. I will not participate. But it was as if he was too old, as if his eyes had weakened. His knees were terribly sore. He turned to ask the young man's help, but it was only the painting he found there looking on him, as if he had just entered. He removed his hat. Why are you looking at me like that, the painting said. Henry, do you recognize me? Next, a little fragment. When Clave awoke, he found he had a companion. A blindfolded dog, middle-aged. Oh, I think we have a dog picture here somewhere. Can you try to find a dog? A blindfolded dog, middle-aged, healthy, white, tending to yellow, lay beside him. Sorry, something. That's all right. Her long, broad tongue dropped like a cravat from her resting jaw. She was felt and attractive, he thought, and smelled relatively clean. To Clave's surprise, his type 2A intuition told him she would, despite the oddity of it, be a possible friend. The blindfold strapped around the mutt's eyes showed she was no ordinary new dystopian canine. It was more than an aid for sleeping in the daytime. It looked as if it had been buckled there, and was that some sort of lock on it for some time? Good evening, the dog said when she'd awakened. My name is Sirius. The name is male, Clave observed. This is my name in human tongue. I gave it to myself in honor of the only readable words of human literature known to dog. You are a dog then, Clave said. As you are an ape, I am a dog. There were police near, Clave noted. It wouldn't do to be seen talking to animals in this section of town. Sirius had a similar idea as well. She leapt up and trotted ambivalently away. There were other wild dogs about, two young males, in fact, eyeing her with sleepy attention. Clave followed. She turned north. They walked along the river in silence as long as it was possible. Eventually, they turned into the traffic-thick streets and avenues of New Dystopia. As you read the book, you realize that New York's name has been changed to New Dystopia. The dog must have recognized him, known in some sense who, what Clave was. Her eyes were blindfolded. Had she smelled his difference, traced his scent into the wormhole? It occurred to him that it was very likely Jaralski herself knew Clave was here. Was A already on the run? They were passing through a neighborhood notable for its art galleries. It would be the last place Clave would expect to find Jaralski. Jaralski, 
quote, when the revolution began in the world outside the bubble of the capitalist empire, contemporary art of that empire found itself confronting its own theoretical and practical infinite at the expense of a thoroughly debunked and abandoned reality. Beyond the upkeep of its own market, art had no coherent function. Even its celebrated relation to the market was accidental." Unquote. In fact, by Jaralski's own reasoning, if embraced, such a position might be a very strong one for air purposes indeed. It was not only in literature, but in the arts in general, Clay reasoned, that a self could locate dystopia as dystopia, the imaginary place or condition in which everything is as bad as possible. Certainly radical chrononautics began in such positions of weakness. It struck Clave that to avoid him, Jaralski might very well insert herself into an arts community. But he had no intuition Jaralski was near. Sirius led west again, and they walked north as close to the river as they could. The snow had all but melted, and the river was colored by the slowing light of the sun. At last, as the island's electric lights began to shine, they turned east. All right, we can stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Mark, as, as you mentioned uh, already, you curated a group's exhibition called Dystopia, and uh, uh, it was in the Museum of Contemporary Art in Bordeaux. And we noticed that uh, the way this uh, exhibition was communicated uh, in uh, press release and information about the, the, the show, um, that you was, uh, you've been credited as uh, 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 someone who wrote the show. That's it, correct. Can you, uh, can you explain us a little bit more about the, uh, the, yeah. the show? How did you write it? This poster here, which is very small JPEG, so you can't actually read what it says. It says an exhibition written by Mark von Schlegel at the bottom there. And these were posters like this all over Bordeaux. I was pretty impressed. With uh, but it was strange to see. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, I think that was my, I, this was actually curated, it was this large show, it was curated by the curator at that time of the CAPC, Alexi Veil. And Alexi, um, he approached me with this idea to do a show about dystopia and have me um, write a catalog, as the, I mean, a novel as a catalog in a way. Uh, and to help him curate the show, like half and half curated. And, uh, but the show was to come out in less than a year, and he just expected me to write a novel and curate the show and all this stuff. But being a starving writer, you know, there was a paycheck attached and a book to come out of this. Uh, uh, and, uh, I mean, it was such an experimental project that I didn't even know what that meant myself, what, I, what an exhibition written by somebody could be. So we were sort of experimenting from step one, uh, not really knowing what was going on, but knowing we were gonna just put art and fiction together. And so a lot of the works I picked were works that I had written fictions for those artists. The first one I just read about the Shakespeare I had written for the painter who did this abstract painting. We saw Francis Schultz. And, um, the next one uh, about the dog I actually just wrote for this, but um, other dogs came from works by Sergei Jensen in the show and um, uh, also Ben Rivers and uh, various other, that friend, that, this is not Sergei, this is um, a French photographer who did these light boxes, also did the cover, whose name is now. Anyway, yeah, so uh, does that get anywhere to answering what happened? Yeah, written by me. So. Um, we knew it was going to be dystopia, so we put this red cellophane on all the windows of this building. And um, when I arrived to start curating the show, that was already up. And it was, that alone was such a uh, shocking, it was really powerful the way it created, you'd look through and see this bourgeois French paradise, but in this like red Martian color, you know, it was really well done. Just that alone created this sort of almost narrative backdrop for all the work. And um, and yeah, and so if you if you as you go through, you start to see how there's sort of the work comes together according to narrative, not according to history or ideas. Maybe little dystopic ideas, but um, hmm. yeah. 
think what, uh, yeah, I mean, nothing I could say is that <laughs> yeah. the book didn't come out in time because the translation <laughs> took so long, you know, which, is, you know, my work's are very dense, and uh, yeah, so I wasn't surprised, but I finished my part on time, you know, but <laughs> so, I, and I remember in French at the opening, one of the curates said, because Mark didn't send his text, and I was like, I understand French, my text is in time, but it wasn't my fault. But uh, we also noticed that uh, some parts of, of the novel were already published uh, before. Yeah, I mean, that was part of what I, my, my approach was, I don't have time to do a whole novel, but, and, and then again, how do you write a novel about these artists whose work I was, we hadn't even selected, you know, and uh, so I knew I was gonna pick artists I had worked with, so I used those texts I had worked with, and, um, I did not combine them like a book of short stories or something. I, um, I cut them up, okay? So each one is like a little fragment of that story and then a fragment of the next story and then a fragment of the first story. Then they're inter interwoven like that, a bunch of stories. And then there's an overarching new story about mm -hmm. Clave and Jurowski who are these, they are time travelers who go to different alternate universes and mm -hmm. then um, completely change that alternate universe when, they are, when Jurowski arrives. And Clave is like hunting Jurowski, who uses a new kind of pronoun. Um, hmm. And this was before the whole pronoun controversy For came. Sure. It was weird. It was like, um, but it becomes a controversy in the book already. But then, okay, so we have the novel, New no Dystopia, um, <clears throat> which appears in a specific given context, which is the exhibition Dystopia. Um, so we imagine that reading the novel makes full sense when it's done in relation to the exhibition to the context to which it relates. However, the exhibition is a temporary event. It ends, it was 10 years ago, but the novel remains. So our next question is, 10 years after the publication of New Dystopia, which degree of autonomy does it still retain? Total, I would think. <laughs> that, that's, my, that's my plan as a, a literary writer in the art community, that you can actually extract it and it can survive. But this book in particular, uh, sorry, this is your copy, but um, as I mentioned, there, there's a section called Nave in which all of the works are, are in the book. No, I mean, these are all the works in the exhibition, not all, some of them are not the, you know, they're from before they were in the exhibition. So the, the works are in the book and there is a kind of abstract relation to them. So, and then the book is designed as a museum itself. So you can't escape the history. So even if you don't know what the show was, the book presents itself as an exhibition so that um, I feel like there's enough of a deal with the reader that they can then work with the text so in relation like to a, art. Yeah. It has a second life beyond the... So in a way, the structure of the book reflects also architecture, the yes, space of much. the exhibition. Yeah. That's it says lobby, you know, on the first page here, lobby. Mm -hmm. hmm. the... uh, yeah, I, I read in a, in a prologue uh, of a New Dystopia, um, a catalog, however, is not simply a literary object. We act with the greatest intent. We offer leaks, not links. As our fiction is allowed into the museum, the art is allowed entrance in the fiction. Invited into rooms, blown into an imaginary void, galleries unfolding in impossible succession, and so on. Yes, I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> you wrote it. Um, so uh, I have one more question about um, about um, mm, uh, um, dystopia. Um, That's a little for what you just said. That the double focus there, like that, it's often there's a sense writers are used in the art community, or writing is used, where it's often like um, I I want it to be both that art is led into writing too here. It's not just writing is led into art, you know what I mean? So I, I'm always trying to sort of stand up for that literary side too. Mm. So in a way it, it went both directions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this was more radically that way, I mean, than ever before, I think, because, and, and um, without the catalog actually being published, it was more successful as a show, I think, because 
all you knew was that it was a fictional, science fictional relationship between the works and that there was one and that there was some narrative presence. But there was no real narrative yet to sort of oppress your vision. So as a reader, you could, or as a reader of the exhibition, mm -hmm. you could, I mean, my fantasy, for me as a reader of the exhibition, I felt that the work was freed of so much of this burden of art language and art and what it's supposed to do is conceptualism mm -hmm. that it suddenly was about the world today as it's getting worse, you know, in a very general, <laughs> and suddenly it was just like, yes, all free and happy together to be sort of, in a way, do things that these, a lot of these artists, conceptual art doesn't do so often, just have fun, play, or mm -hmm. have some imagination. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, you know what I mean? <laughs> work together really intensely. Hmm. Um, so as part of our research uh, with David, we also investigated uh, uh, investigating um, how actually f uh, fiction could become a, a kind of archive, uh, using narrative fiction as, uh, as a means uh, to document performance or exhibitions which gives uh, access to areas of, of experience where uh, other methods cannot reach, like photography and video. Uh, we have some, actually some good examples of this, how fiction or informal stories uh, uh, turn into fiction could serve uh, this, uh, this purpose. Uh, so, um, because it also, fiction can be a tool also to investigate also relationships between public and uh, artists, and uh, uh, we think it's a kind of new way. It could be a new mean, way of working. I mean, the novel in particular has a relation, suppose, I mean, in the history of the genre, I think, to reality, you know? It's like a, it's a sense of the public market of the novel, you know, and that it gives us sort of, at least a, as I think the terms you guys established, of the fantasy of that for an artist. Or, yeah. yeah. So the question is, would you consider the use of fiction as a, this kind of method of archiving some specific artistic experience which cannot be uh, archived uh, differently than yeah, by I, writing? I, I, think that, um, I think that that's an interesting question and um, it's very complex, but I think there's a danger which is that um, I have a text in, um, in this book about American literature called, it's, this book is called Realometer, and uh, one text is called Surface Fiction Depth, and it's, a, it's about this famous Poe story where the purloined letter, and in this story, there is an enormous amount of backstories in the story, you know, there's almost no surface story, it's almost all, oh, a long time ago, this happened, a long time, but, and the things that happen are incredibly insane, like they're, they're so outrageous, and you're like, did that, what, wait a minute, what is he suggesting? And it's actually really unclear. It's radically uncertain what is actually in the backstory, yet that is the whole story. So it's sort of a um, abstraction of what's going on in literature, which is sometimes, which is that there is depth, but that that depth is not determined by the author, totally. That depth is up to the reader, and that's about Similar to a Lawrence Wiener work where, where the reader supposedly creates the, the work. Same, there's that's going on with literature where the reader, and when you don't know what's being archived, when the reader doesn't have access to that, um, I don't know if it will survive in the right way or not, but I think that makes it special. That makes it a sort of separate genre within the genre where there's a sort of hard edge, where there's no depth in a way. There's no depth in an art novel. <laughs> in that same sense. Um, at this point, before we switch to the Eagles uh, series of short stories as art criticism, so we are going to switch years from creator's novel to art criticism written as fiction. Um, <clears throat> I would like to invite you maybe to read another excerpt, but this time from the Eagles series, which we will talk about in a minute, but just very briefly to introduce is that <coughs> uh, for some time already when Mark is invited or requested or commissioned to write a uh, review of an exhibition or a text for a catalog, an exhibition catalog, you might respond with 
a short story instead of the expected essay or, or review. <clears throat> and what I find really, um, really unique to this approach is that throughout the years, and we are talking about like 15 years now, these stories, 16, 16 <laughs> years, <laughs> These 17. stories are set in the same fic science fiction world in a way that every uh, short story helps to flesh out this fictional world. So this becomes more apparent when you publish them as anthologies. And, but we'll talk about it in a minute, but I thought it would be nice if you could maybe read also a fragment from yeah. one of these equals uh, yeah. series stories. So they're always... I'm always invited to write for an exhibition catalog in a, in a fictional way, and so I developed this character that I can always rely on. Um, and the character is, or the char it's a set of characters, sorry, and uh, all based on one character named Ickles, but uh, who's the head of the business and the others work for Ickles. But uh, Ickles is sort of modeled, and the relationships in it a little bit are modeled on art world people also, and because it's always traveling to some exhibition. It's about travel and internationalism. And the, but this is all taking place in the 2090s. And um, uh, yeah, and in assistance, you know, the relationship of insistence with the, with the genius and with each other and with the world. <coughs> so this is from one that I did for the, sculpt the Munster Sculpture Project, this big sculpture exhibition, their last catalog. And um, it was a huge book, so this is a tiny little bit in the end. And it was called Munster Crystal. Call me Archibald. Some months ago, never mind how long precisely, I thought I would go back to work. Perhaps it would help with the circulation. I had been feeling blue. Ordinarily, whenever I find myself growing grim about the mouth, whenever there is a damp, drizzly November rain in my soul, Whenever I find myself not dancing, rather involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, I head straight to Laurel Canyon to catch up on the bookkeeping at Ickles, etc., Info Architects. At most Ickles projects, sorry, as most Ickles projects occur far away from where people know the practice well, and Ickles the original being something of a pushover, there are times I am able to use this freelance work as an opportunity to see the world. So it was some months ago, while serving Ickles, I went to Munsterland. My mission concerned, quote, invisible art at the turn of the 21st century. I studied up on the rocket over. Artists of that fascinating moment didn't see their work as invisible. It's our 2090s term signifying our own inability to know today what their work looked like at all, or often where it was located. It's a freak of history, but by the 2050s, new molds had finished off what various happy fascist book burnings had already almost accomplished, which was the destruction of all authentic published material from 1980 to 2040. Art of this era depended so much on textual apparatus that without text, the work virtually disappeared. Then the data plagues of the mid-century did away with the electronic records, and numerous pranksters and trolls after that created so much false information around art of that time that much of so-called invisible art was false or lost. So a whole industry had grown up around explaining what it might have been, especially in places like Munster, that had invested so much of their reputation and cultural capital back in the day. Every 10 years from 77 to 2027, the city hosted the Munster Sculpture Project, the important international exhibition that Violet Reeves' current boss, cultivator Phoenix Klaus Koenig, meant to revive for the hyper-contemporary age. With the convertible and mysteriously beautiful Westphalian geodome overhead, they had rain any time they wanted in Munsterland. The city proudly constituted a nearly intact pre-digital urban reality. You walked at surface level, out of doors. Augmentation was highly limited. I ducked. Three large fly cycles bearing matrons at tea missed my head by mere centimeters. Nearby, I spied people descending below surface as if in a normal city. The stairways were divided by gender, however. I am as old-fashioned as the next and follow local customs to the tea. However, I soon discovered I had not entered a subsurface 
subsurface transfer as I hoped, but the male-only side of a public urinal, and not only a urinal by the scent of things. One broad-shouldered man stood there on guard against me. I felt I was suspected, yet this was a happier scene than at most such institutions. I had to climb actual stairs out. Was this an artwork? It was. Very likely so, they said, by one H.P. Feldman, and why not? With that reality behind me, I look forward to more of this invisible art. That's a real piece, I don't know. <laughs> if you've been to a Munster, there's a Hans Peter Feldman. So in this story, every, the, one of the jokes is that I talk about all the work and the, the narrator gets everything wrong. Uh, you know, he, he, he misunderstands everything or thinks they're from the wrong place, you know. And so. so, yeah, I think we should mention that uh, the first anthology of uh, Echoes was published in 2014. Yeah, I forgot and to And it was called it Echoes, etc. Et and then Echoes ad infinitum. That's the yeah. fragment we read. 2020. So... <clears throat> yeah, do, uh, this uh, character develops. Uh, yeah, through and the side characters like Archie, the, the yeah. that's his accountant. Sorry, Ickles' accountant. Yeah. Uh, by the way, you can't say his for Ickles. Also, there's a there's a, a pronoun freak out with Ickles because. So I I guess there is also uh, an, uh, a huge complexity behind this fictional world you are creating. Mm. Yeah, I mean, um, it's almost Are they all connected jokes. To this, uh... like, it's very humorous, in my head, and um, there's as many kinds of humor as I can put in almost in one text. I try to like different kinds of humor, even. Um, uh, yeah, does that help? Yeah, I the want first, to. Yeah. Sorry, 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 nothing. No, go ahead. <laughs> I want to mention a writer and critic, uh, Lynn Tillman. Uh, mm -hmm. She has developed a kind of similar strategy that, where each time she's commissioned to write sure. a text for a catalog or a review for an exhibition, she responds by writing a short piece of fiction. And I want to quote her. <clears throat> so, open quotes. She says, "I don't expect answers from art." It doesn't speak as people or other animals do. The preposition to is preferable to about. I'm speaking and looking at or to an artwork. I am not explaining it, not talking about it, but addressing myself to it. So my question would be, do you agree? Would you agree with this uh, Lynn Tillman's statement? Because, um, I have the, that your equals project or series follows a similar idea where you don't write about the, about the exhibition that you are commissioned to write for, but rather you write to it. Uh, like yours is a piece of creative work addressing itself to other artworks. But I don't know if you would agree. Yeah, with I that. mean, I, I, I'm not as much as Lynn Tillman. But on the other hand, um, her general approach of fiction, yes, that was really, pro I don't know if that's where I got the idea to do uh, this, but uh, I, when I lived in New York in the 90s and I was starting out as a writer, she was in New York writing this stuff and or, or she was publishing these things and I, she was, she wrote for one of my zines that I, <laughs> and so she was a big influence, yeah, and, uh, and that approach to the way, you know, to look for models of how writers could um, survive, I don't know if that's the word, uh, but, you know, uh, participate in the amazing publishing that goes on in the art communities and, and the way how writers can um, make a practice there. She was a real a pioneer in that for me and others. But in the sense that it goes back again maybe to the question of the oh, autonomy. Towards the or, artwork of, yeah, yeah I mean. Um, the autonomy of I the mean, text I, again. I mean, the Ickle stories are, are a little bit more addressed to the curators in a way. They're always sort of making fun of the city it's in or in the location and about the larger group show they're often about. But, um, but, uh, but I often do shorter texts for catalog essays that are directly, exactly as you say, where, um, and I felt a little weird doing this for some years because it's a little, I don't know, the prostit sex work is what you're supposed to say. But anyway, you know what I mean? You kind of like, you deal with, you, you bring your fiction just for this work and you're like, am I, putting myself below the work. Or, and yet then I, in the history of science fiction, and you know, I, I write science fiction because I love the genre and I'm a fan. And you know, some of my favorite writers of that 
I have discovered, or some of all of our favorite writers in the golden age, it turns out that they were given assignments where they had the cover of the magazine and they said, hey, Isaac Asimov, here's his picture, write a story. And he wrote Nightfall, his most famous story, you know, from the picture on the cover, you know. And so uh, I was like, wait a minute. Uh, one of the reasons science fiction is so great is because it gets away from that artistic ego a little bit. It's mm -hmm. Sort of like conceptual art that way, or, you know. And so, yeah. And, um, but as a yeah, but it also goes the other way around because every piece you write retains a lot of autonomy in the sense that it's fleshing out yeah. a fictional world that only becomes complete when you have yeah, the But whole it's crazy anthology. how much the work will give back to you if you write. Mm -hmm. It's hard to write about work, you know, as an art writer at a certain point. You just get, you know, when, you're, when there's, you it, it, just do a new way. So you have to like, it definitely helps to see it as like a, you can, really engage with it physically or you know emotionally as a person or something yeah mm. it's much better and imagination and fiction writers have this really naturally because that's what we do we sit there and imagine relationships and things <laughs> so we can do that with our works yeah i would like to speak now a bit about the intro a little bit more in general at large about the introduction of fictocritical writing in contemporary art <clears throat> so let's try to define what fictocritical writing is it's not easy i never find it easy to speak about it, but I'm going to quote somebody who tried, uh, Herit Haas, in his book, Fictocritical Strategies, Subverting Textual Practices of Meaning, Other and Self-Formation, that's the title. He explains that, and I open quotes, the name fictocriticism is often evoked to subsume motivated experimental writing practices that confound and thereby problematize the generic distinctions between fiction and criticism between fiction and non-fiction, between philosophy and literature. Fictocritical texts are usually playful in tone and experimental in attitude. Okay, oh, a close quotation. And well, you call your ICO series a series critical fictions. So is that like fictocriticism? <laughs> you around fict fict yeah. critical fictions. So my question is, would you identify your writing as fictocritical? And in that case, how do you understand fictocritical writing through the lens of your own practice and, e and experience? Yeah, <clears throat> I think in a text you once published that Chris Krauss and I did together, I think we mentioned this that um, uh, a long time ago in like 2005 or six, I don't know, uh, four maybe, 2004, before maybe my book came out, we were, um, co-teaching a class. We lived in LA, so um, there was San Francisco Art Institute, a writing critical class. And Chris couldn't go there all the time, so she got me to do half of it with her. I was pretty unknown at the time, and, and I was happy to have the job. And she, I remember she said, because she knew my writing, she knew her own, and she said, let's do it on, fic we'll, we'll do fictocriticism. And I went, yeah. But I had never thought of the term before, really, or I didn't think twice. I was like, yeah, we'll do that. And we, we showed up. We prepared a bit. We thought about what we had thought that might mean. And, and then the whole, I remember that whole semester, everyone was just like, but what is fictocriticism? And we said, I don't know. You just tell us. That's why we're here. You know, let's do it. Let's make it happen. Because, yeah, there's not much, you don't know what it is, but it's pretty obvious in one way. Uh, like Oscar Wilde's portrait of, Mr. W. H., which is a fictional story. It's a historian who discovers this truth that Shakespeare uh, had written Romeo and Juliet. The Juliet was based on a boy actor in his company, and that he discovers this. And it's written as an, this Shakespeareana, you know, like if you love that genre, people writing about what, what, who was Shakespeare. It's in the perfect, but it's all fiction, you know? And so this kind of thing really influenced us in, uh, in, in thinking of what. Oscar Wilde. He has a whole book, The Artist as Critic, which that's a big part of. Hmm. <clears throat> and so, yeah, that, that um, fictocriticism seems to be, a, uh, yeah, naturally from our time. And then, you know, we're in the age of fake news and all of this. I don't want to get too into that, maybe, but. So there is a double edge. Well, yeah, it's just obviously, it's, it's just comes natural. It came natural to me when I first started doing, even in the 90s. Like, I mean, the idea that. I was a fiction writer and I, and I shifted over to study literature. So I had already began as fiction and they made it very easy to shift. 
but I knew I would get a teaching job and last long. So I, I, I took my opportunity to do that. But there I started to resent this voice and criticism that pretends like, even though you know, deconstructionists and, and post-structuralists, they're sitting saying there's no meaning, yet they're saying there's no meaning. You know what I mean? How can you do that? How can you tell me that he can't tell me something when you're telling me that? Yeah. You know what I mean? And so this seems really obvious to me as a fiction writer. So uh, my approach was always to be like, yeah, and subversive. I'm from the 90s. I wanted to be indie, anti-corporate. That's my approach to writing punk rock or whatever. So yeah, subversive to, to do the wrong thing on purpose. You know? Yeah. And you know, in <laughs> recent years, there's been a debate about the crisis of our criticism. There has been <clears throat> a lot of problems raised with uh, curatorial language. Uh, even the emergence of the so-called international art English, and all of it points, in our opinion at least, to a sense of exhaustion about a kind of language that is being employed to write and read about contemporary art. Um, <clears throat> so it's often the case that the critical text that is supposed to mediate the artistic experience is actually adding more obscurity to it. It's actually doing the opposite of what it's called to, to do. And here I would like to read an example from a book uh, whose title I'm not going to say in public, but it's a book about contemporary art from 2016. I'm going to just read a fragment so you hear what we are talking about, but I'm sure you are all familiar with this kind of language. This two volume essay collection is concerned with the meeting of subjects in a historical moment that calls for new account of our ideas of both the subject and meeting. The project explores, explores these concepts in the context of non-sentient interactions dominance, attempting to move beyond anthropomorphic theories, objective agency, and think material capacity, as well as an intersubjectivity of subjects whose boundaries resist definition. Intersubjectivity takes up the complementary problems of non-discursive language and non-linguistic discourse in an attempt to locate the distinctions and respective abilities of philosophy as a particular kind of art, and art as a particular kind of philosophy. Uh, I mean, I have no idea what I just read. <laughs> uh, and it was a, bl a blurb, right? And it was a blurb of the book. It's supposed to make you want to read the book. Yeah. Uh, but this is the language that we are used to but deal obviously with. that obscurity pays. There's a reason they pay money for that. You know, yeah. I, I mean, it must help something. It definitely valorizes art, what you just read at the end. It says, it ends with art is philosophy. Is that the last Yeah, philosophy I mean, is art because so, one of the... One is of it? The, I thought it was something different. You know. One of the traits of uh, international art English is this uh, uh, reversing of the... Co so they say, for example, the meeting of subjects, and then they say uh, the subject and the meeting, and then... They say the intersubjectivity of uh, subjects, and then the subjects are inter So they do this like three times. But OK, so our question is, do you think, because OK, we, are, we have seen a lot of uh, uh, seminars and articles and books that address the issue of a certain exhaustion of this critical art writing, let's call it like that. But I rarely or never see a proposal in positive terms, like, OK, instead of that language that we all assume is dead, we can you know, write differently. So my question would be, is would fictocritical fictocritical writing offer an alternative to this uh, exhausted model? Or, I mean, it's not like the answer, but do you think it could be at least? I mean, that's, that's sort of what it is for me. But on the other hand, I do um, also write straight criticism sometimes, if I get paid a lot of money, because <laughs> it takes more work, you know, in a way. I, I mean, no, it takes more research, that's what it takes, <laughs> which is hard, a different kind of work. Uh, so, yeah. Um, but wait, what was the question again? <laughs> the question is, if you think that uh, a fictocritical approach to oh. writing could be a valid answer Yeah, I mean, I think lots of people, there's, there's, I mean, there's different ways to look at fictocriticism. Like, you could also think of autofiction, which is very a term uh, describing sort of autobiographical fiction that's a, very popular now um, in the art community. And this kind of approach, a sort of autobiographical, biographical, anecdotal approach to contemporary art, it, I find really, uh, much more pleasurable to read. I don't know, uh, 
Yeah, and I think within that you can then incorporate theoretical problems and, uh, and uh, but you'll often find people like who are fiction writers or poets employing those strategies, not so much critics, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. using sort of narrative of their own life but that's another way to go. I mean, because I do think the fiction thing can become a little bit of a cliche, uh, and it has been in press releases and stuff. I don't mind. I still write them because I get paid for them. <laughs> and uh, I don't have to... The wonderful thing, I, I compared it to um, Stanislaw Lem. This is a little embarrassing because I'm not saying I'm anything like that quality, but uh, this writer approached science fiction as something he could get away with during the totalitarianism of, of um, Polish life at that time. And, uh, and uh, in a way, science fiction for me is like a way to escape also the things so much you can't say if you really were honest in an art publication. You know what I mean? Uh, mm -hmm. That it's really hard to, to have any kind of honesty if, if you approach it in that way that Lem did. And so fiction is the natural answer to that kind of... And I think it, in our world, it's really hard to articulate anything non-fictionally anymore. Mm -hmm. Just because we realize that our sense of reality is a fiction. So it, it's a bit harder than to, to, to trust non-fiction. <laughs> but also maybe because criticality can only take you that far, yeah? It's, it, you engage with reality in a certain way. Um, but you need maybe to appeal to other cognitive skills like uh, imagination, which is stimulated by yeah. fiction, yeah. in order to, okay, you disagree with a certain uh, state of things, yeah. fine, but you cannot get stuck at that critical analysis. I studied with literature. With imagination, uh, you can picture alternative scenarios where things work differently and then invest your desire in that and then take action exactly. in the real world. Exactly. And, and maybe pleasure to too, no? First. And then, exactly. And then there the is the pleasure of reading. Exactly. To I make think pleasure part of the artistic I activity. think also that uh, contemporary art is really highly codified, that we all need to learn uh, uh, this codified language. So add, adding more codes to this uh, uh, context, it, it makes art even less accessible. And uh, there is this paradox with fiction that we are trained from mm. our childhood to read fiction, to, to identify with characters, to, to, to follow up a narrative. And I like uh, this, uh, also this context of uh, reading fiction that you are in a way uh, going back to this context of your childhood or kind of Storytelling. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You don't need a kind of a specific training or sophistication. Yeah. You already. You're, yeah, I mean, I, for me, it's very exactly kind of what you were saying, you guys, because I studied, at that time, I'm telling you when I studied literature, not writing. I studied, I uh, was lucky enough to study with uh, Jacques Derrida for a while. And basically, what I picked up at that time from him as not a total critical writer was to go negative as a critic, because. Yeah, if you start being a critic and start being positive in a way, um, you're a fascist. <laughs> you know, I don't know. And start point to a deconstruct. <laughs> so that doesn't mean, however, that there's no space for positivity and for love and whatever and in uh, criticism. And exactly what you're saying is where it really comes from anyway, is where it comes from your imagination, your emotional, you know, and so in your, your personal history. So that's why I'm saying bring those things and like you say, also bring that into criticism seems natural. And enjoyment, uh, no? It's like and it's, yeah, and uh, pleasure of the text, yeah. I mean, I, I've noticed, I think my work gains from being fiction in places it's not supposed to be because it suddenly has an architectural effect on the volume. Like hmm. a funny short story in the middle of this dry art history book suddenly makes the whole book a book. Suddenly you're like, I don't know, you forget with that language that you're looking at a book. It's some kind of weird, I don't know, you know what I mean? It's a mm -hmm. hallucination or I don't know. And when you remember it's a book, oh, then you suddenly smell the pages and see the images in a new light. It's a little, the same as this art in this dystopia show was freed from, it's almost more important for art to be freed from discourse nowadays mm. than to be um, attached to it, even though people are always desperately trying to attach themselves to a, 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 an important discourse. All right. Um. So I'm just going to jump in really quickly, also because uh, as a bit of a 
time reminder yeah. we've got maybe like five ten minutes but fan amazing exciting fun conversation and interesting topic i mean it's sort of awakened a memory for me where um david when you first sort of said you were pivoting to look at artists novels i was like wit no curators novels i was like which curators have written novels like wow that's going to be like a a very uh, a finite um research and in this conversation, I realized I wrote a curatorial novel. I did it. I did one. Oh. It was back. <laughs> and there's a whole lot of points, because it was back in 2009, 2010. David's taking notes. <laughs> yeah. Damn, that's a year before this. What the hell? No, but it was, it was the Alexis Vaillant, actually, because it was okay. a group of six curators. And one of the curators was French and was in love with Alexis Vaillant, completely uh, under the spell of, of what his curatorial signature was. So she drove that. But the reason we ended up writing a novel was because it was a curatorial program, six curators who'd arrived to the Netherlands from all over the world, and it was just as Wilders was coming into power. And we were trying to comprehend the political discourse that was swelling around us. And eventually the only kind of tool that we could help to understand it was a psychoanalytic uh, reading of paranoia and of a paranoid disposition. And so we ended up doing an exhibition that was trying to understand what the paranoid psychological formation was. It was an exhibition that was about sort of anxiety and unknowing in relation to the far right. And the novel is the novel of a curator who comes to Amsterdam to do an exhibition and throughout the novel disintegrates into a paranoid fantasy about the color blue. And blue is invading his life and is coming through the news and is sort of uh, swirling around. So, um, yeah, so anyway, so that's a memory that I had, but I guess I had questions about Alexis Vaillant as a curator, given that he seems to really have had the signature of the novel, but also in terms of the piece about um, fiction in a time of totalitarianism or, or fiction in a time of, yeah, uh, political restraint, uh, yeah, and, and disintegrating consensus reality, basically. Mm. Yeah, if I, sorry, if I can quickly no. react to what you said, it makes me think of uh, <clears throat> with, if you mix fiction and criticism, yeah, fictal criticism, you have the advantage that your text uh, does not only refer to contents external to the text, mm -hmm. but actually the text, the text can perform those contents. And when you're speaking about paranoia, you not only maybe describe or try to analyze what paranoia <coughs> is, you can make the reader feel what it is like to be paranoid. Because like Joanna said, we are already trained in uh, using imagination. Imagination is the capacity to make uh, present things that are absent. And we don't have to be instructed in that. We already know how to do it. And then you can also learn something through the text that is actually through your own uh, vicarious experience, if you want to put it like that. So um, I just wanted to very quickly mentioned that it opens the door to a more performative experience of the text rather than just speaking about something that is external to the yeah. text. Yeah? A role for us, suddenly in a world without a role anymore for, for these texts, the art community has provided a home <laughs> and a role sometimes that um, maybe even a new role. I mean, I do think here you know, when you talk about this artist novel, that flat one in a way, that that is a kind of new kind of writing that's maybe for an age where the novel is less intimately connected to people's being and you know what I mean? I don't know, it's, it's still mysterious, but um, I think I notice a lot of young people, artists naturally jump into writing fiction uh, without fear the way mm -hmm. young fiction writers have fear or self-consciousness, they just sort of jump into it and, and really, <laughs> uh, wow, they really just, it's just like air for them. Hmm. Younger generation. Is there time for any questions, um, or are there any questions? I would like to uh, make a question. Should I get there? I love that you uh, that you present a dystopia at uh, the CAPC in Bordeaux, and uh, and one of the uh, I am also a fan of uh, Alexis Valente. I worked with him many years ago in 2005, and uh, and I learned a lot from him and. One of the things that I learned, and knowing that there's a number of graphic designers here, w I wanted to also point out that a, a key reference for him in terms of a writing fiction, a, what could even be called a fiction theory, or in terms of a theoretical fictions as it is with a Chris Krause, is um, actually the circus man P.T. Barnum. 
And P.T. Barnum uh, has been considered not only the father of advertising in many different schools, and certainly not within the literary circle, but in terms of uh, public relations, precisely because he uh, ran these editorialized advertisements in the newspapers and in the tabloids that he designed in the late 19th century that created narratives for each of their characters. And so the, one of the biggest uh, learnings that I had with, uh, with Alexi was that uh, we had to think about advertising and presenting exhibitions in the way P.T. Barnum had done, that the only way that we could create an interest was by creating a narrative around the characters that were actually normal, but that okay. people wanted to hear abnormal things. And the beauty of this uh, event, I became uh, completely obsessed with, uh, with this guy, and I studied him like crazy and blah, 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 all this thing. And then I found uh, that the magician, Kevin Killian, who some of you may know, uh, the magician Kevin Killian, he's a voice in Magnolia, you know, there's the, the film of Magnolia. He's a voice over in Magnolia, and he's also in that, that uh, film of uh, uh, Kurt Cobain that he commits suicide, I don't remember the name of the film. If you saw it, that there's uh, a guy that's driving into the house where it all happened, that guy, the, dri the co-pilot is Kevin Killian. Anyhow, he collected a history of exhibitions, or his book or collection of posters, which were designed by Pete Barnum and other circuses, the tabloids, the editorial lights ads, is his history of exhibitions, which I think relates again to the, to the dystopia context. So just to preface this in terms of the P.T. Barnum um, as a kind of a considered a kind of a proto crypto fiction or fiction theory or whatever it's called, in terms of shows, right, in terms of display, and, uh, and the caravan that we use ought to go to the international projects and so on. Is there any character of the kind beyond Steve Bannon, I would say, that you think uh, has, a, has that power within a culture a, that it doesn't come from the literary field, that doesn't come from the art field, but that like P.D. Barnum comes from another industry and has a huge impact in the way in which we perceive a fantasy imagination, a show itself. A, the idea, I mean, he also is the one, just so that, that we contextualize this, not only did he do this in writing, he's also the one that invented a, the idea that a, there should be a procession a, of the circus into the city that comes in the evening, se sets up at dawn, and then is there in the, a, in the morning already with a tent. So the idea of procession, the idea of editorialized writing, you know, he was really a master of uh, creating public engagement uh, through these imaginary fictional things that he presented as exhibitions. So is there anyone that you think uh, in other industries um, in contemporary times, again, not Steve Bannon or Donald Trump yeah, or such, say, yeah. but some, someone uh, whose work has a kind of reorganized a way in which we think about public engagement through something like a literary tool. Um, I mean, it's more of a curatorial question in a way. I mean, I can I mean, I, I can just think in general. I think there's been a, a um, terrible Hollywood. I mean, or whatever. This kind of uh, all I can think of is, I mean, I think things are different. I mean, first of all, there are critiques of Barnum too. You know, I mean, the yeah, man yeah, was the you know the face of American capitalism, the showman. They sort of led to terrible things. You know. And, you know, noir literature, which is a big influence on me, comes out of the freaks attached to those professions, you know, and the crimes and the, the dark side of that American dream. But on the other hand, uh, it was much better then because this new corporate, I mean, but he's the beginning of corporatism, maybe, I don't know, but with corporatism in science fiction, for instance, um, it's had a terrible, or in publishing in general, there's no longer... Like all of the science fiction that I really love from the 20th century came from the paperback revolution, this moment where the, all these different competing small businesses publishing books on the common market. In the 1990s, all of those companies disappeared and they were all taken over by one company. They destroyed the cheap paperback, reissued them as trade paperbacks. Even Semiotext used to be these black 
pocketbooks that I felt cool as a kid to have my I was like a theory kid if I had that book. But when my first novel came out, they changed format to, to these massive $15 things that don't fit in any pockets of my pants. But uh, anyway, yeah, so these decisions are huge because there's no longer in science fiction, I don't know who's watching this, if I should say this, but uh, uh, it's so dominated by a few corporations now in America that there's very, the editors just define what the market is. There's no more, the science fiction community is no longer coming from the fans. The fans are being farmed from above. Like it used to be, science fiction was so amazing that Ray Bradbury began publishing fanzines as a 12 year old kid and by the time he was 25 he was writing novels of science fiction, you know what I mean? So it was about this kind of um, uh, self-made, Thing. It wasn't about corporatism. So. But there are communities now of fan fiction, no? Yeah, in the like, internet, actually. But I mean, that just, uh, but that's corporate because it's just, in other words, the, the giant company who owns Twilight owns the imagination oh. of the fan fiction. You know, mm. Jules Verne wrote a continuation of uh, Poe's novels. I mean, there's fan fiction comes, it's, it's nothing new. It's just corporatized now, you know? It's... Uh, they're all online, they're controlled, and they're, they're, they're put into product. You literally at the conventions, sci-fi conventions, people are so overweight, they need wheelchairs. They're like, they don't move to do anything. They're just farmed, you know? <laughs> it's just um, kind of shocking, I think. And the writers are, are, are made to do one book a year, you know, and it's become too much of this corporate shit. And we need to get back to the self-published, <laughs> the, the sort of grassroots. I think that there's a lot of the 19th century that we could uh, think through in terms of that. But I'm also, uh, I don't know if there's no more questions. I really think that we should move on to the next program. Yeah, I'm just sorry. No problem. Is it okay? Yeah. I love this. We're going to have a wine break instead of a coffee break just so that uh, we all have a glass of wine Sorry if and we, ca we can approach you uh, informally and ask more questions to the book lovers and to Marco Anschlego. And uh, the wine is here. Uh, Sophia, so, do you mind if I say one yeah, thing? Because for you sure. mentioned the 19th century now and I, yeah. I, it made me think that the way uh, Mark is publishing his short stories throughout different commissions is a little bit also like um, episodic novel from the 19th century and then they are compiled in a single anthology and they read pretty much like a novel so i was thinking of that kind of yeah. connection but uh, in a contemporary context no it's wonderful and there is much to say valeria luiselli for fundacion humex she wrote the story of my teeth and we can continue talking but my thinking is yes let's have <laughs> a glass of wine so that boda and victoria can present to us their book and uh, it's been a very long day and uh, we want to really hear about your book with a glass of wine all of us no sounds good and then uh, uh, there's coffee, of course, downstairs if you really want a coffee.